that okay might actually be reducing as you go down. So, now that you've known your observational study designs, you've also known your interventional study designs, where we say the observational study design, you as a researcher are not the one that is administering the intervention, you're not the one that is administering the manipulation. While in an interventional study design, you as a researcher are the one that is administering the intervention. It's quite interesting that when you mention a clinical trial, what comes to the head of most of us is the fact that this study design would actually happen in a clinical area, right? It's not necessarily true. And also we start thinking it's only going to be about drugs. Clinical trials could actually involve Drugs, it could also involve things like just a basic education in school, for example, where you want to say, I want to determine whether giving students this kind of education would improve their performance. Then you randomize the, sub the students to that package of education and the other students you randomize them to not having that education and you measure the outcomes. That is a clinical trial. It's not drug involved. What is involved is particularly education. You see what I mean? So it is basically an intervention itself. When that study design involves you administering the intervention, it would actually fall in a clinical trial. Is that okay, guys? Is that okay? Great. So let's talk about the prospective cohort studies. So the word cohort really came from, uh, it really remain, relates to like a group of people, right? It came from uh, a situation where they were actually looking at an army and then moving in a certain direction and things like that. So basically, when you look at a cohort study, you're actually going to recruit a certain population of participants. Now, particularly when you talk about the prospective cohort, what you're actually going to recruit is a population of participants who have your exposure of interest. You have participants with your exposure of interest. And then you also get participants without the exposure of interest. So what is happening in a cohort study, the prospective to be particular, is that you're starting with participants who have the exposure of interest and those without the exposure of interest. Then you actually follow up these participants for a certain period of time to determine who gets the outcome of your interest. When we look at the example of malaria and mortality that we had talked about, what this would imply is that you have a group of people who have malaria at a certain time point, and those without malaria, no malaria, at time zero, okay? Time zero would probably be a situation which you have to effectively define. And then you follow these people up from this time zero for a certain period of time to determine outcome, which is mortality. And what you're actually going to say is, yes, somebody died, or no, they did not die. Do you see that? So you check in this group and in that group. Who is dying more? Is it these persons with malaria, so that you can attribute the mortality to malaria, or 
is these persons without malaria so that you can say that there's no difference one would actually wonder why then do we have this group of participants without the exposure of interest and these participants without the exposure of interest we usually call them the controls we call them the controls while well, these participants who have your exposure of interest you call them your cases or this is your study population this is your control why do you need the control you will need the control because the control is what will give you what we refer to as the counter factual what the counterfactual is, this is the outcome that should have been observed in the exposed participants if they were not exposed. The outcome that should have been observed in the cases, may we call, may we call it that, if they were not cases. Which means that if somebody did not have, if this person who has malaria, if they did have malaria, this is how they were going to end up in terms of mortality. So that is what your counterfactual is. It's very important to have the control. And the importance of this transcends even to clinical trials where it makes even more sense. Because in clinical trials, you as the, as the, as the researcher, being the one that is administering the intervention, you notice that, well, the outcome of your interest will be observed even in those that you have exposed to the placebo. This means that you have introduced a whole new drug that treats, um, that causes sleep, per se. You're saying this drug would cause sleep in people with insomnia. And then you expose your participants to this drug, which, cause, which, uh, which, 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 which causes sleep in people with insomnia. And then you also expose these people who have insomnia to a placebo, which is just a sham drug which does not contain the active ingredients. But what you are going to see is that even in these people who have just been exposed to something like just water, let's say water is your placebo, they will also start you know, having your outcome sleep. This is referred to as a placebo effect. And the value of placebo effect should never be underestimated in research because it does exist. Is that clear? So you need the group where you are actually going to be able to see what would have been the outcome in these participants that were exposed if they were not exposed. This explains also why you cannot compare to the way a person was at baseline. Because one might want to argue, to say, okay, fine, if indeed what I want to see is whether my drug works, all I have to check is the parameters at the time I'm starting and compare it to at the end of the study. You compare the after to the before. I do not need a control group. That is also undesirable due to the fact that what happens is that there are many other factors that would come in place, such as, for example, the placebo effect, which you couldn't see if you're comparing to the baseline. So a control group is very crucial for research because it gives you what to compare with so that you are also able to see the effect you would be able to see the effect size of your intervention or of your exposure in this case is that okay so at the end of the day in a natural a prospective cohort study you are studying starting with people who have your exposure 
of interest and follow them up into time to determine whether they end up with your outcome of interest. You need to actually be watchful when it comes to a cohort study and the case control, which will come to later, because most people tend to confuse the two. Because why? In a cohort study, you are hearing what you are calling the cases and the controls. In a case control study, you will still hear people that will be called the cases and the control, and people fail to decipher where the difference is. Is that clear? So, bear in mind, in a cohort study, you start with participants who have the exposure of your interest, then you follow them up within time to actually observe whether they will end up with your outcome of interest. I'll give you an example of a cohort study, and it would be the study that I had done for my PhD work, where I was trying to determine the incidence or I was trying to determine an occurrence, a new onset of kidney disease in patients that begin treatment with tenofovirus which is a drug used in treatment of patients, uh, persons living with HIV. The starting point was defined as the point when somebody initiates treatment. You see what I mean? That is a well-defined starting point. So what we are saying is that as this person is coming for treatment, this person will actually initiate them on treatment. Therefore, this person becomes exposed to my drug of interest. Then I want to follow them up for a period of three months to determine who ends up with acute kidney injury or acute kidney disease, per se. So they don't have the outcome of interest at the time they are starting, but they have the exposure of interest, which is the drug. And then I follow them up within time to see who ends up with acute kidney disease after treatment for three months. That is a prospective cohort. And the follow-up was active within time, in future. This is day one. After two weeks, they came back, we checked. After one month, they came back, we checked their kidney function. After three months, they came back, we checked their kidney function. It's a prospective cohort study design. Is that okay? Now, if that is clear about the prospective cohort, I want to introduce the retrospective cohort. When you check the meaning of retrospective, usually this talks about going back in time. And people tend to confuse a retrospective cohort a lot. In fact, it's the one that is confused the most with the case control study. What a retrospective cohort study would involve, most of the time, many a retrospective cohort would involve getting data which, is, which was already collected. This data was already collected. Then you get this data and start from a point where these participants had your exposure of interest and then you follow them up for a period of time to see whether they ended up with your outcome of interest. Is that clear? So, for example, if you are going to say, fine, I, I want to determine another thing. In this study that you were doing, I want to go and determine whether these patients also ended up with, with uh, hepatitis, for example. And what you do is get up to date, you go to the database and find the data. You identify the participants that were exposed to the treatment, and then you say they have the exposure of interest, which is the drug, and then you follow them up for a period of about three months and see what happened to their liver in this period of time. So you started with the exposure, which is the treatment, where they didn't have your outcome of interest, and then you follow them up 
to determine whether they ended up with the outcome. This becomes a retrospective cohort study. It happened back in time. But the key thing is that you're starting with people who have an exposure of interest and others who do not have many the exposure of interest. All of these people do not have your outcome of interest. Is that clear? They don't have your outcome of interest. These patients, when we were starting the treatment, they all did not have kidney disease. It was participants who had preserved kidney function, an intact kidney function with a cemented glomerular filtration rate above 60, and no history of kidney disease. So these participants started with an intact kidney function, all of them. Then you follow them up within time to determine who ends up with the outcome. That's a prospective cohort. You're doing it in real time. A retrospective cohort, you go back to the data and try to determine whether they ended up with the outcome. This data is actually available in the database. Why the prospective cohort becomes more, much stronger in this case is because this is happening in real time. You're actually determining most of the things that you actually can act also control for and things like that. While a retrospective cohort becomes quite restrictive because you might want to actually check for other things, but this data may not even be there. Right? Let's say these participants you want to determine whether they ended up with hepatitis after treatment, then you want to use a certain other biomarker of hepatitis other than ALT, for instance. Presence of viral hepatitis in their serum as your marker of hepatitis, right? then this was not done at the time when I was carrying out the study. You are restricted. You can only use what is there. Is that okay? So this is why a prospective cohort study becomes better because as you're carrying out a prospective cohort study, you would make your decisions yourself to say, okay, I'm going to measure hepatitis and this hepatitis I'm going to